How is everyone, by the way? We kind of just complain about our problems. I didn't forgot to check in. Did David actually forget? Oh my god. I wonder what he's doing. Surely not nothing. He was active 21 minutes ago, so surely he... He's probably watching a lecture or something, I think. Yeah, he forgot. Here we go. He's here. He was, he was notioning. Got carried yeah. away on notion. Yeah. Classic. Classic David. How's anatomy this week, guys? Um, like, what are they doing? Are they doing? They're doing the leg. What are you guys up to? I'm guessing, because you guys have tibia in here. <laughs> Is it like the lower half of the leg, like near the foot? Is that where they, I don't know where where you guys are up to? I barely know where we are up to. I don't even know what we're doing at the moment. Pharynx and larynx sector is a mess. <laughs> yeah, apparently, like, Lucy was telling me about the pharynx lecture and she was like, it took me, like, 50 minutes to do one slide and I was like, are you serious? I want to cry. I, like, gave You're it. up to the foot. Oh. Oh. What was the foot? We'll, we'll do it later. Um, let me know if there's anything you want to go through, like, specifically, and then just drop it in the chat and we'll go through that stuff later. Saskia. This is a recording, but... I like didn't learn the foot and it was fine. So don't stress. <laughs> I barely learned any anatomy and I'm still here. <laughs> it's kind of biting me in the ass a little bit, but like, you know, it's, right. it's okay. All I know is the navicula means the boat. <laughs> I'm going to stop her. Let's start. Yeah. Oh, they kind of released all of lower limb at once and like just, yeah, they do that. It's the not an effect of adrenergic stimulation. Um, in other words, like what is not uh, sympathetic? Um, dilation of people is sympathetic because you want to let in as much light as possible. Um, bronchoconstriction, um, you want to get as much air in so it doesn't make sense to constrict your bronchioles. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, they're in gram neg. Um, and yeah, they're bad because of sepsis. Um, but you can also get sepsis from gram positive as well. Um, but you don't find endotoxins within gram positive bacteria. Um, so TSS1 or toxic shock syndrome, um, that's by Staph aureus. I uh, often get it if you have, um, through tampon usage, if you um, don't swap them out. Um, strep pyogenes, you'll come across later. Um, that one is for rheumatic fever. Yeah, rheumatic fever. Um, Haemophilus influenzae um, affects kind of your lungs and then epidermidis. Um, affects your skin. Um, yeah. And Staph aureus affects all of them. 
um, but toxic shock syndrome is a particular one from Staph aureus. So this is a bit of a buzzword question. Um, so yeah, rice water stools typically from cholera. Um, if you see rice water, it's going to be cholera. Um, rotavirus kind of causes your gastro, your gastroenteritis, which you would have done like a tiny bit in the first set, I think. Um, Clostridium botulinum kind of paralyzes you. That's no fun. Um, and diphtheria. Um, is just doesn't line up with your rice water stores. Um, like it still affects the guts, but um, your cholera is the one that results in rice water stores. Um, and then overseas, um, it's it's a bit of a generalization, but generally in Australia, we're lucky enough to not have cholera um, since we have access to clean uh, water supplies, whereas overseas, they might not be as privileged. Um, yeah. So access to fresh, clean water may not be as readily available. Good. So um, this one, the answer is given away by the fact that we're looking at different countries. Um, so we're looking at a very big picture scale. Um, country A has this many prescriptions and this much and this prevalence of rashes um, compared to country B. Um, so looking at a very large scale and it's going to be ecological. Um, matter analysis is kind of um, a combination of multiple studies. It kind of gathers them all together. Um, so it's not really specific to different countries, it's specific to kind of different studies and collating the results. Um, and then cross-sectional, um, you're kind of taking a snapshot, snapshot view into different population groups. Um, typically, typically like an age group. So you look at, I don't know, zero to 18 years old, 19 to 25, 25 to 50, 60 to 90, or something like that. Um, so not so much to do with different countries, but typically different population groups. Um, so gold standard will always be your RCTs um, because those are considered experiments. Um, so you're going to be purpose, you're going to essentially, um, you're specifically manipulating the dependent variable um, to obtain a change in the, in, sorry, you're specifically changing the independent variable to elicit a change in the dependent variable. Um, and it's only through that where you can establish a cause effect relationship. Um, case control is something I have forgotten. I need to know <laughs> what case control is. Um, uh, case control is where it's like the study design is backwards in time. So it's the one that people right. get confused with the cohort study. So it's like the opposite of a cohort study. You do it backwards in time. Yeah. 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 Um, cool. So the definition, just looking at the PowerPoint, is um, you identify individuals with an outcome of interest. Um, so let's say they got disease A, and then you look backwards through their records to find possible exposures. Um, so you're looking backwards in time. Um, yeah.
Um, yeah, so sympathetic is all uh, thoracolumbar. So from your T1 level all the way down to your L2 or your L3. Um, there's a bit of debate around if it's L2 or 3. Um, and that's a sympathetic. Uh, your parasympathetic, um, you can kind of get it from the name. So para means next to um, or surrounding. Um, and you think if you, we well, haven't done the back yet, but um, how it goes is your cranium, your head is above um, your thorax and your sacral region is below your lumbar. So craniosacral is parasympathetic, whereas your thoracolumbar is sympathetic. Um, lumbo, lumbro sacral um, is kind of where all your lower limb nerves come from. And then thoracosacral, I just made up. Yeah. Um, your cranial bits are your cranial nerves, uh, which we'll do next to you. Gave me the answer. Um, yeah, parasympathetic is craniosacral. Um, sympathetic is thoracolumbar. The other two aren't relevant for your autonomics. Great, good. Um, yeah, perfect. So um, the key word here, or the, the main bit to get confused on is the autonomic nervous system. Um, cerebral cortex, it kind of is, um, it's a major decision-making center uh, where like all your thoughts are located and all your memories, um, but that's not part of the autonomic nervous system. Um, your hypothalamus is all autonomic um, and it kind of directs everything. So that's why we call it the bus. So beta one, you have one heart. Beta two, you have two lungs. Um, yeah, so it's all like kind of thoracic area. Your heart and lungs are right next to each other. Um, kidneys, yes, you have two kidneys. Oh, wait, hang on. This question probably should be better worded. Um, predominantly found on the lungs. That's the one we care about most um, because we do have a bit on the kidneys. I will fix that up. So overstimulation, um, if you overstimulate your muscarinic, you're going to overstimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so you'll rest and digest. Uh, so therefore, um, your, your um, intestinal tract is going to be overactive um, and it's going to push through everything way too quickly, uh, which is why you're going to get diarrhea. Um, it can't be tacky uh, or high heart rate. Um, because you get tachycardia from your sympathetic nervous system. Um, so if anything, you'll get brady, you get bradycardia from overstimulation of your um, muscarinic receptors. Um, and Zoe has put in the useful, um, useful uh, the acronym um, for overstimulation of muscarinic receptors. Uh, so diarrhea, urination, 
meiosis, uh, bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, lethargy, and salivation. That's a, that's a good one to remember. Um, so we don't want to do that just in case some of the beta-2 receptors get activated. Um, sorry, uh, just in case we block some of the beta-2 receptors. Um, so we don't want to cause beta, don't want to cause um, bronchial constriction. Um, so therefore we don't give it to people with asthma. Um, good. So, so gamma co-activation serves essentially to help us measure um, the the tense, the what's it called, um, how taut our muscles are. There's a better word for that, but how taut the muscles are. Um, and if our spindles kind of shrink, then they'll get all slack. Um, so we want to make them taut again, and that occurs through gamma co-activation. Uh, so it ensures that um, our muscle spindles remain sensitive even when we're shortening our muscles. Um, immune response, there is co-activation, but it's not gamma co-activation. Um, and then, yeah, it can't be green because it does the opposite of that. So the sartorius muscle is a very, very special one because um, I believe it's the only muscle that both flexes the hip, um, so brings your knee closer to your chest, as well as flexing your knee or bending your knee. Um, and that's because it kind of wraps around um, your thigh. Um, yeah, so if you see, if you see um, them giving you a description of what flexes the hip and flexes the knee, um, it's going to be the sartorius. Um, also called the tailor's muscle. So um, this one, I always just like to swap it around. Um, so I would, like, naturally, I like to think that the gluteus maximus is by the superior gluteal because that makes sense in my head, um, but you want to swap it around. So the gluteus maximus is innervated by the inferior, whereas the medius and minimus are done by the superior. Um, so it's a bit counterintuitive. Um, So um, important to remember that your nerve is most lateral. Um, so it goes navel, lateral to medial, um, where you have your nerve, artery, vein, um, some empty space, and then your lymphatics. Um, your artery, vein, and lymphatics are located within the femoral sheath, uh, whereas your nerve is the only one that is outside of these structures. Um, and that will be important for when you do, I think like hernias, I think.
Good. Um, so in this case, we're going to be talking about like most of our femoral arteries and like things kind of like that. Um, and those are going to go from the anterior to the posterior through the adductor hiatus um, to enter that back of the knee fossa or the popliteal fossa. Um, your inguinal canal, um, I'm not sure if you guys have done it yet, but it allows kind of contents, um, notably the spermatic cord to pass from your like, abdominal cavity, um, yeah, abdominal cavity into the scrotum. Um, popliteal hiatus doesn't exist. Um, and then under the inguinal ligament is how they kind of get uh, from your abdominal cavity. It's like your femoral uh, nerve artery and vein. Um, yeah, femoral artery and vein, sorry, um, into the anterior compartment of the thigh. Um, and that's where they switch over from the external iliacs into the femoral. Um, so it's through the adductor hiatus, which is a hole uh, found in the adductor magnus muscle. Good, so it's the medial femoral circumflex. Um, that'll come up really, really important, come up as really important, uh, or it's probably already come up, um, because if you kind of break this circumflex artery, then you're gonna get avascular necrosis, or possibly you're gonna get avascular necrosis of the um, head and neck of the femur. Um, and you don't want to let that happen. Um, lateral femoral circumflex doesn't quite supply the neck and the head of the femur. Um, it supplies a bit more distally. Um, same with the deep femoral artery. Um, and then a superior gluteal is kind of on the gluteals. Um, so it's not talking about the bones. So a um, bit of a mixed answer here. Um, so remembering that your inguinal ligament, um, you can kind of picture it as being your groin. Um, so it's going from your ascis, uh, which is something that you can feel in yourselves. Um, kind of at the front, it's this prominence that you can help it. Um, and it goes from there kind of to the midline. Um, so it'll be starting at the ascis. Um, which gives us a hint that it's yellow. Um, and the pelvic tubercle is kind of right next to the pubic symphysis. Um, and this is where it attaches to. Um, and it kind of arches over to create a space underneath the inguinal ligament. Are the pubic and pelvic tubercle the same? Uh, yes, I'm fairly sure they are. Um, the pubic arch is close by. Um, however, the pubic arch is kind of the angle that you get um, underneath the pubic symphysis. Um, acetabulum and asus um, is not quite anatomically possible um, because your acetabulum is where your, your head of the femur articulates, whereas your asus is kind of on the front of your hip. Um, so it wouldn't be possible to kind of get your ligament around your hip. Um, and then once again, the pubic arch is located underneath uh, your pubic symphysis. Um, so it doesn't touch underneath. Very nice, very nice. Um, cool. Good job, everyone. Um, hopefully that was a bit helpful.
Um, so that's what we started to do for these cookbook quizzes. Um, I think there's a document I put on the extra resources and I'll share the link to the Kahoot. Um, otherwise, otherwise we kind of have to copy and paste it, like all the questions into a Word document and that just takes a bit of time, which I couldn't be bothered to do. Um, so yeah, we might make a start on week six then. Um, I think you might be first in. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> All right, uh, hey guys. So I'll be covering inserts, steroids, as well as DMARDs, or otherwise known as disease modifying antibiotic drugs. Um, the key point to take away from this is this stuff is easy. Like, it's just simplify as much as you can for yourself. Understand how they kind of work. Don't stress too much about memorizing as you guys did with like. At, um, like antivirals and like all the different types of penicillins like earlier on you did in semester one like actually generally like genuinely understand how each of them works and then you'll just figure it out like these things aren't hard and it's probably one of the better and more kind of satisfying things that you will learn um, in in week six as we see steroids and NSAIDs generally being used a lot in the communities all right all right so NSAIDs so how do NSAIDs work? Essentially, they're based on this idea of prostaglandin, all right? So we've got to firstly understand what prostaglandins are. Essentially, NSAIDs firstly just inhibit prostaglandins. You can find prostaglandins like pretty much everywhere in your body, like in your blood vessels that help you like kind of dilate. Um, you can see uh, prostaglandins like, um, like uh, in er when uh, prostaglandins is often seen in like erectile tissue, like there's prostaglandins pretty much everywhere. So if we think of prostaglandins as being kind of dilator even, of course, if NSAIDs are able to um, decrease the amount of the prostaglandins produced through inhibition of its synthesis, then we can likewise tell um, the kind of decreased inflammation response as well. Now, what are NSAIDs? What does it stand for? I'm sure you guys already know. So NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and the main thing is they just stop the production of cyclooxygenase, and we'll go into that in a second. I'll just touch on a few more points on this slide. Uh, so prostaglandins are just these unsaturated fatty acid derivatives containing around 20 carbons, so like ring structure. You do not need to worry about that. They're also known as acosinoids. Um, you also don't need to worry about that. I just had it there because they kind of said it a few times last year at, uh, when we were going through it. Um, Yep, so they work on tissues and that make them, um, and they break them down, and it breaks down pretty quickly, um, and it doesn't usually go into the uh, bloodstream in large concentrations. And thromboxane, um, you guys probably will know that from your hematology lectures, uh, speaking of the, uh, the coagulation cascade, as well as leukotrienes are kind of related compounds, and they all come from the precursors um, of prostaglandin, and we'll be touching on that uh, just in a second. All right, so how do prostaglandins actually get made? I like if we have to understand how NSAIDs work, we need to understand what it's actually targeting. And you need to think of from this point onwards to probably the end of med school. Like, I don't know if that's true or not, but like at least within second year, drugs have now stopped becoming about memorizing. It's all about manipulating physiology that already exists. That's all pharmacology is now. Like understanding what is going on in the physiology and just find a way to manipulate it so that it results in a desired effect. And likewise, if we manipulate normal physiology, then of course there's gonna be side effects as well. And those side effects are exactly the one that you will be encountering um, when you're speaking of contraindications or um, the kind of impacts that uh, if someone asks like, oh, why can't you give this? And then you will have a better answer uh, completely based on physiology. So try and understand the basics of all of this before actually just like our key flashcard, all of your drugs, like actually just take a moment, understand it, explain it to a friend and it will help a lot. So prostaglandin synthesis, what is this? Well, all bodies in the, in all tissues in the body uh, produce prostaglandin and it comes from arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid basically is like cleaved off um, from the fatty layer, the phospholipid bilayer of the cell, right? And this is what everyone's saying, oh, why do I need to learn all the biochem, all the like really basic stuff we've already learned in first year, uh, like in semester one, like 
What is, is the point of that? Well, this is the point of it now, right? Like, you know what a phospholipid bilayer is. You know that it is has a hydrophilic and hydrophobic end and all of these things. And arachidonic acid is cleaved off of that uh, bisphos bisphospholipid uh, layer uh, through phospholipase and phospholipase A2 in this case. And it breaks off this arachidonic acid which, if you can see the diagram here, into two pathways, all right? So firstly, it can split into leukotrienes and that's sort of lip lipooxygenase. Um, that one you do not need to worry about. Leukotrienes is mostly uh, in regards to kind of pain sensitization alongside with uh, histamines, but so like, um, so histamines produce pain, but yeah. So basically that side, don't worry about it. Just look at the bottom side of it, right? The prostaglandin synthase part, how erectonic actually becomes this prostaglandin uh, and different types of prostaglandins. So there's PGE2, um, PGI. So there's like different types of prostaglandins. Um, for our kind of studies, right now at least, all you need to worry about is prostaglandins are all the same. Like don't worry about what type it is, like what specific number it is. Like that doesn't really impact how enzymes work, at least for our understanding. So all you need to do is kind of just understand, all right, cool, prostaglandins comes from arachidonic acid. And from then on, it can kind of be produced into like other prostaglandins, thromboxanes, as I was mentioned before regarding the uh, hematology coagulation cascade. You'll keep learning that over and over again. So if you ever feel you're getting overwhelmed by that coagulation cascade, don't worry. Like this year, we're in second year and we're still a bit like, um, what is uh, factor five, right? Like, don't worry about it. Uh, it. It will keep coming back and back. And plus the cyclone. Um, so we'll be focusing mainly on the cyclooxygenase pathway here. Now, what is the cyclooxygenase pathway, right? So the cyclooxygenase pathway are basically these prostaglandin ring structures made up by the uh, cyclooxygenase pathway. So it produces prostaglandins, prostacyclins, thromboxane, and from that arachidonic acid and through this cyclooxygenase pathway, which is just an enzyme, two cyclooxygenases are produced. The first one is COX-1, right? So that's not for normal physiology function, functioning and COX-2, which elevates the production of prostanoids that occur in chronic disease and inflammation. Now, <clears throat> the point I want to raise here is you need to appreciate the difference between COX-1 and COX-2 and impacts of NSAIDs on this. Let's just say, right, like let's just say we come along, um, we come along with an NSAID that blocks both. So then, of course, that's great. We block COX-2 because that kind of cuts away the inflammation from chronic disease. But also, we also like hit off COX-1, right? And that's a bad thing because it kind of pr protects us through these protective prostaglandins and other things like that that we have in like gastric mucosa that can kind of prevent like H. pylori gastric ulcers and things like that. So actually appreciate the two different COX-1 and 2 and how they're um, different in um, and have different kind of responses and uh, roles in our inflammatory response. Uh, so COX-2 is usually influenced by inflammatory mediators like the, your tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin 2s. And this can be inhibited by pharmacologically by glucocorticoids. So that's kind of our steroids, which I'll be talking about in a second. Um, and COX-2 has a, usually it's a little bit bigger than COX-1, um, but that's like pretty low yield. So don't worry too much. The main takeaway for this slide, therefore, is COX-1. What does it do? COX-1 is for normal physiology. It's good. It protects us. One is good. Two is bad, right? It comes secondary to it as a response to inflammation. Now, going on, uh, going on again, it's the same slide. I just added a diagram here. So you can just see, like, it's kind of within the DNA. And then COX-1 is usually just, like, chugging along. It's, like, constantly kind of being produced. Um, but then COX-2 is like usually only induced by oxidative stress. So then you can see that like after exercise or if you kind of not have somehow like have a lactic acid buildup, right? And then you have injury. So like, let's say you fall down while running and you get a scab and then there's a bit of inflammation there. Ischemia, we see that in um, heart attacks, seizures and neurodegenerative diseases. So glucocorticoids act very early on. They prevent this kind of stuff from even reaching the mRNA to produce this COX-2, right? So glucocorticoids are a little bit higher level. They prevent the inflammatory response from even re reaching the uh, DNA replication, which actually produces further inflammatory markers. Yet, sterile, uh, sorry, uh, NSAIDs actually come down later. So once it has been produced, we prevent them from um, 
causing the actual uh, further inflammatory and inflammation and pain. Um, so think of the different layers. So right now we've covered NSAIDs and later we'll cover steroids. So NSAIDs is like the most symptomatic kind of treatment. It doesn't look at um, what is causing it, whereas good corticoids kind of stop it before the causative agent actually leads to DNA replication and the kind of inflammation response there. Um, and I think uh, someone else will be talking about it next week regarding um, local anesthetics as well as um, new receptors, so your opioids. Is that today as well? Yeah, okay, so, so yeah, someone else would be talking about like opioids and kind of new receptor stuff. So that's even higher in the pain kind of hierarchy. And so it's a really good way to think about these drugs. Think about it in hierarchy and which step of the way is it kind of stopping it? And if it stops it here, what might be the side effects? What did I stop now and what will be the impacts of that? So always, always, always have this systematic structure of thinking about things. Don't just memorize isolated facts. That's going to help you uh, write up um, like that's not going to help you write a good exam. You're going to have to think about how each things um, are in correlation and are in kind of dance with each other. So taking us through a little bit more specifically of NSAIDs, aspirin is the one that everyone knows, right? Like NSAIDs, it's a traditional NSAID. Um, basically, it exhibits antipyretic effects only at high doses. So aspirin is one of the weird ones. Um, there's been a lot of studies on it. Um, if you, any of you are curious, you can look up the Asprey study. Everyone's been like kind of, it's like digging into it. Um, anyways, uh, so yeah, aspirin at high doses are for uh, antipyretic effects. Antipyretic just means like anti-pyro, right? If anyone of you has played TF2 back in the day, like pyro is like the fire guy. So it's like stop the fire in turn. It's like stop the fever, right? So antipyretics is, um, is that. Uh, anti uh, aspirin also like uh, in low doses prevents cardiovascular events such as myocardial infarction. Um, there's always like a bunch of debate regarding whether aspirin is like good or not for um, MI. So I won't go too much into that. Um, yeah. So aspirin is also differentiated from other NSAIDs. It's, it's also a reversible inhibitor, irreversible inhibitor rather of cyclooxygenase. And can you think of any kind of um, Impacts of that? Well, if it's irreversible to cyclooxygenase, and we know cyclooxygenase produces all of these great other things like thromboxane, um, like your prostaglandins or gastric mucosa. So within those types, right, like there's a lot of problems, right? If it's irreversible, and then like, let's say I'm like constantly taking aspirin every day, and then suddenly I fall down and I start bleeding. Uh-oh, that's like super bad, because suddenly if you want to go to surgery, it's going to be really difficult, because you're still going to be your platelets from the NSAIDs are, are going to be still like irreversibly bound to these NSAIDs. And so they can't, sorry, the cyclooxygenase, right? They can't actually um, clot properly as if you were, if you weren't on aspirin. So it's really important to kind of consider um, the impacts of irreversibility on bleeding. Yeah. So we have here with like NSAIDs, like anti inflammatory effects, analgesic, antipyretics, and, the, um, and acetaminophen is just the American way of saying um, panadol, okay, so uh, paracetamol, okay, so that's just like a different way of saying it. All right, so anti-inflammatories and painkillers, um, so anti-inflammatory, right, so there's a, firstly, inhibition of uh, cyclooxygenase diminishes the formation of prostaglandins, we've already covered that, NSAIDs inhibit inflammation in arthritis. So that is probably the biggest yield, like highest yield that you will encounter for NSAIDs. Like what do you use NSAIDs for? Well, musculoskeletal diseases. And we usually see that in like uh, rheumat uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis. And I'm sure you guys have all seen the ads on TV about like neurofin and all of things like that, about how they're like neurofin for joint pain, neurofin for osteo, right? Like all of these things are just kind of the same idea. That's why like, when you're kind of like going out and buying brand, like uh, drugs, like, uh, that sounds wrong, doesn't it? <laughs> going out and buying drugs. Um, you're not going out and buying drugs, you're going out to the pharmacy and legally purchasing the recommended amount of uh, paracetamol or, or uh, ibuprofen. Um, what, is, what, what about it, right? Like in this case, once we understand how each drug works, then we understand that marketing plays such a big role. Like you don't really care about what brand is it. All of them work in the same way, so same way. So technically, they should all be the same. So analgesics, what do they mean? It just means like um, 
it just means removal of pain, basically, right? So uh, PGE2s are sensitized nerve endings. So someone will be talking about this in a second. So PG, prostaglandin 2s are essentially, they sensitize nerve endings uh, to allow bradykinin, bradykinin, histamine, and other chemical mediators um, to kind of actually create the pain. So prostaglandins don't create the pain. That's also something like someone will probably touch on. Yeah, I just like emphasize it since it's inserts here. But just think of... Um, What's a good example? Just like, think of, um, let's say, let's say your nerves is like, uh, like, it's like the wood, right? And then once you cut the wood off, it's like, it's like barren. And then you come along and you just like, like pour a cup of honey on it. And then you're like, oh, that's fine. Like it doesn't actually create pain, right? But then like all the bees are like, B, why do I say B? Because brandy kind of starts with a B, right? And then, yeah, anyways, uh, so that all the bees suddenly come on and then they see the honey and they start attacking it. And the bees actually create the pain. It's not actually like the honey, right? Like the honey is just like chilling, but like the brady kind comes and creates the pain. So if we think about incense, essentially if we take away the honey, like we stop the honey pot from even pouring honey on the first place, then like, of course you can't, the pain is going to be so much better because bees are going to come and attack you. So it's like, very logical like all of these things it's very like you can create an image in your mind right like it's it's it makes sense okay um and i'll stress msk right this is what you guys do in anatomy and this is what incense are for so um pharmacology goes with anatomy and everything just like slowly 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 comes together all right so paracetamol this is like a really interesting one um and this is the one that like your friends will 100 percent ask you like i like they will probably this will probably be one of those questions that when you first, when your friends ask you, you'll feel like so big when you're like, man, I'm going to med school. Like, I know my stuff now, okay? So they're going to be like, oh, like, I've got a headache. And you'll be like, hey, like, um, so you should take some Panadol. And then they're like, oh, but I don't have Panadol. I only have Nurofen at home. And then you're like, oh, but you should get Panadol because, and right, segue into my slide right now. So Panadol actually works on your central nervous system. And it appears to be, um, it's not as like it's not as useful as anti-inflammatory, so that wouldn't be good for like as good for your NSK disease, right? But par uh, paracetamol mainly works on your COX enzymes. Um, yeah, so it mainly acts on your kind of um, works on your central nervous system and prevents a pain there rather than like inflammation elsewhere. So in this regard, paracetamol kind of produces a greater body reduction. Um, so if you're kind of febrile things like that, paracetamol will drop it a lot. And if you've got, got a headache, paracetamol might actually be better. Um, but on the other hand, ibuprofen, so that's neurofin as well, uh, provides a longer duration of antipyretic uh, effect um, than acetaminophen. So that's Panadol. I'm just using different names to kind of remind us that Big Pharma exists and is watching you. Um, so four hours after in intervention and the initial temperature to permit lasts longer. Basically, paracetamol is not a classic NSAID. It's not actually considered an NSAID. We just say like, because NSAID, what does it say? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, right? Like paracetamol doesn't do anti-inflammatory. So technically it's not an NSAID, but like we just lump it all together. Like NSAID plus paracetamol, simple analgesics. That's what we understand them to be. All right. So this takes me back to something I was talking about before, the very basic physiology and how it changes um, these things. So in the GIT, this is like the classic one. Someone comes in and be like, oh, I pop like five um, Panadol every day for my osteoarthritis and now I've got tummy pain. And you're like, where's the tummy pain? It's like, oh yeah, above my belly button. And then it's like, is it better or worse after you eat? And then you ask them a bunch of these questions. You guys will do this later on in the video. But this is, goes back to what we were talking about, about like H. pylori, like last semester, right? Like when we were doing the micro, uh, microbiology kind of stuff. So essentially what it does, right? Like your, so your stomach is like really nice. It usually has like this lining in it. It's like thick, it's like, we're just chilling out here. It's really good. But then like, if you keep taking those inserts, it's just gonna like reduce the amount of prostacyclins available there. And if it reduces the amount of prostacyclins available, then the gastromucosa slowly, slowly like gets thin and thin and thin. And then, so therefore these H. pylori bacteria are able to, the urease that produce will become more effective in kind of like stabbing a hole through your gastromucosa, right? And that's how uh, peptic ulcers uh, kind of, kind of uh, occur. And that's why like NSAIDs, you should kind of eat it with food or fluids to diminish these GI upsets. Most of us like who are young and healthy won't really notice it. It's often in uh, elderly patients. And this is why like often when we think of NSAIDs, we're like, oh, they're just like 
um, over the counter, right? It's like really chill. It's just like paracetamol, right? But in reality, even like in ICU setting or in any, any other setting, like this is like really important, right? Like it will actually create a change. I'm not sure if any of you watch the scrubs, but in like the first episode, JD asks um, Dr. Cox, it's like, how many, how many panadols do I give, right? Like while at, in one sense, it's like such a dumb question. You can just give how much you want. But then um, Dr. Cox is like, oh yeah, just like, I'll throw in however much sticks or something. Like, I probably missed the quote there. But, like, it kind of does indicate that prostaglandin inhibitors or, like, cyclooxygen inhibitors, so NSAIDs in this case, actually um, will have a big impact on overall long duration. So it has anti-platelet uh, effects. So this is what I was saying about aspirin and uh, thromboxane kind of gets uh, reduced as well, leading to reduced platelet aggregation. And that's why, like, before surgery, we want to, like, uh, stop aspirin for a week and make sure that uh, normal uh, hemostasis is, is, um, is achieved. As well as renal effects, so this is the triple whammy that you'll probably, you'll learn about next year, so in year two. Um, so NSAIDs prevent the synthesis of uh, some prostaglandins that maintain renal blood flow and therefore, like, retention of salty water and causes edema. So prostaglandin... Um, Afrin or Efrin? <laughs> which, which one does it call, do again? Afrin. Afrin, yeah. So it causes Afrin vasodilation. So if you stop that, then it will actually get shrink. Don't worry about it. It's like mixture stuff. But I do want to point out that there's a triple whammy that you guys can kind of should like just like remember in the back of your head. Back when I was doing my GP visit like last year um, in year one, this is like the thing he told. So like caffeine, uh, NSAIDs and diuretics, wait, no, sorry, ACE inhibitors are the three things. Oh, so, diuretics rather. So, diuretics, um, NSAIDs, but that's like the coffee one, um, as well as ACE inhibitors. So, those things, those three things can't go together. If they go together, like your kidney's gonna have acute uh, renal injury, acute kidney injury. All right, quick. Steroids, all right, let's think about steroids. So steroids aren't just your like super massive bulky dudes like in Hollywood movies, right? Like they actually have some good therapeutic impacts and can um, be really, really helpful for our patients. So how are steroids made usually? Well, usually they're kind of made like um, in the, in the okay. zona fasciculata uh, because the first layer is your mineral corticoid, so that's salt. Um, and then your glucocorticoids is in the middle layer. Um, yeah. And then so the glucocorticoids are usually just uh, kind of impacts your carbohydrates and protein metabolism um, and has anti-inflammatory activity as you would expect. Don't worry about mineral, cort mineral corticoids. You do not need to worry about that in first year. Um, we don't really even touch on that that much in second year either. So don't stress. All right, so indications, why would you want to give uh, corticosteroids, right, or glucocorticoids? There's kind of similar names for both things. Well, um, firstly, Addison's disease. Well, what is Addison's disease? Well, Addison's disease is basically where you have like a very low level of glucocorticoids. And essentially through Addison's disease, we will slowly try and replenish your level. And uh, this will be um, done through like mineral corticoid um, sort of, so through mineral corticoids or through um, other glucose steroids. So the mineral corticoid that you would use here is fludrocortisone. Um, and Addison's disease is sometimes it can be primary or secondary, but usually it's a result of something else. Don't worry about it. Just know that Addison's disease is categorized by lethargy, weakness, hypotension, and dehydration. And among that, there's just like a little bit of um, and why Addison's disease is relevant for corticosteroid replacement therapy. Inflammatory diseases, um, so stop uh, early at, and late stages of inflammation. There's a lot of different ones. Um, so, um, so for example, some people have like uh, chronic, uh, like chronic lung diseases, and, infl inf and inflammation will constantly occur there. So, some people have like chronic bronchiectasis, and which is basically just like constant, like the mucus isn't able to be coughed up, and inflammation will be good there. Oh. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, this is obviously your go-to. Uh, autoimmune condition, so steroid therapy just represses it. And in your mind now, you're obviously thinking, like, all right, so if it's an autoimmune condition and now I'm doing steroids, right, 
what am I essentially doing? So essentially what I'm doing is um, I'm blocking out the immune kind of response to this information. And now you're thinking, all right, but that's bad, right? And I'll get into that in a second. So likewise, allergies, asthma, bee stings, uh, anaphylaxis, these are all kind of inflammation responses. For example, asthma, it is also inflammation of your kind of, uh, it's a reversible sort of inflammation in your, um, in your bronchi, um, so in your lungs, um, and that's like through eosinophils and, and other interleukins. Um, yeah, so essentially think of uh, corticosteroids, steroids, and all of these things as being um, preventing as well as relieving inflammation uh, at an acute as well as a chronic state. So it's very versatile. Mode of action, um, so basically it can happen really fast. So it can suddenly decrease hyperperfusion. Uh, it can um, essentially decrease Yeah, so it can essentially, sorry, I, I need to correct this, acute vasoconstriction. Um, yeah, so no, vasoconstriction should occur rather like as a result of, um, of it. So that's a, that's a type of the, um, I'll, I, will, I will change that. Actually, can I change that now? So. Oh, that, that, was, that was a bit of a yikes, uh, but okay, great. We've, we've, um, we've fixed that up and now it's a black screen. Great, okay, cool. So um, it also decreases capillary permeability, which is good because you don't want all the fluids kind of escaping as well as uh, decreasing white uh, cell migration as of course that would also lead to um, more kind of information. And if we look here, this is a really nice diagram showing the timeline of it. So angiogenesis illustrating is like um, stopping new creations of like small veins and uh, small arteries, um, blood supply. So less blood supply equals what? Less blood supply equals um, less inflammation. But at the same time, right, we're also thinking to ourselves, all right, less blood supply means that maybe healing is going to be slower, right? Exactly. So if cortisol, right, um, will also actually decrease your kind of, uh, your healing response to injury. And that's why like when you're stressed, you have a high level of cortisol. So that's the same idea of steroids here. Your immune system is gonna be impaired and that's why you're more likely to get a cold. And I really would really recommend all of you guys to kind of go through these, like the therapeutic impacts of drugs and think about the flip side. Drugs are always, um, drugs are always a two-sided blade, okay? It's, um, Double-edged sword, two-sided blade, what is, like, what do you mean? Uh, Double-edged sword, okay. So it can cut one side, it's good, but on the other side, it may also cut you back. So um, just be aware of that always, like as your way of thinking. So long-term, it can, wait. yep. So long-term, it can just be hours to days. Um, cortico, uh, glucocorticoids bind to these cytoplasmic, so within the cytoplasmic glucocorticoid receptors, um, and this inhibits phospholipase A2, right? And if we think back to our diagram before, phospholipase A2 is a thing that cleaves off your phospholipid bilayer uh, into becoming the arachidonic acid. So which means if we inhibit that phospholipase A2, it means arachidonic acid can be produced. And less arachidonic acid just essentially means less um, prostaglandins, prostacyclins, and that equals less honey, less honey equals less pain, okay? So uh, that leads to also an inhibit, inhibition of transcription factors. So necrosis factor, Greek letter B, um, and also decreases expression of pro-inflammatory genes. Uh, basically means that the stuff that causes inflammation is gonna be less and then inflammation is actually gonna decrease. All right, uh, translocation uh, to the cell nucleus, essentially what it does is like after it attaches to the uh, cytoplasmic glucocorticoid receptors, it drifts and drifts and drifts like, until it reaches kind of the nucleus and bind to the glucocorticoid responsive elements, GREs. And from there, the promoters, um, within the promoters of anti-inflammatory genes, so interleukin 10, and then that goes to increase the expression of anti-inflammatory genes. Um, so that's like a next thing. So I have an image on that side. So it essentially means works on the DNA replication part of things as well, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, great. So if you look here, all right, so glucocorticoids, it's like just chilling. There's two ways of usually going about it. The first one is it goes to the membrane receptor, and this is a rapid non-genomic response. 
non-genomic just means it doesn't go to the nucleus and it just means that it has an in kind of the first part, right? Like the vasoconstriction part and it kind of inf impacting the cells around it. Um, sorry, yeah, has there just been questions? That's just me. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, yes, and then the other one is like you can go through a cell membrane, attack those to those glucocorticoid uh, receptors and those will kind of lead to the chain of events that lead to it. Um, yep, and exactly what Peter said, like, don't worry too much about the details. Just kind of know like annexin is, does these three things. Um, and like, obviously it prevents cyclooxygenase too. Um, and I don't even know what like PLA stands for here. So don't stress about it. So side effects, right? So this is what we're talking about, about like the bad things about um, uh, glucocorticoids. And this leads us back to about pathophysiology or the basic physiology manipulation of these drugs. So as all drugs, remember what they do, steroids is suppress the immune system, so it prevents excess inflammation. And what does that mean, right? Like if your immune system is suppressed, what does that mean? So you are more susceptible to bacterial infections as well as like other, other pathogens. One of the really, um, Kind of ones that we always think about is oral steroids um, and that can cause thrush in candida albicans and you can usually scrape this off um, but you can't scrape off some other like white tissue and that's just like a good clinical way of differentiating between the two um, so when would you even take oral steroids you guys might be asking um, so you might be taking it um, in an acute response to like asthma or something like that so you see glucocorticoids like literally like everywhere um, but they do have pretty deleterious impacts. So always keep that in mind. All right, so just a quick comparison between steroids and NSAIDs. Um, so as you would think, NSAID, why are they like kind of over the counter? Well, it's because they're pretty safe most of the time um, and they're really cheap, so they're okay. But the bad thing about NSAIDs is that they have some like cardiovascular complications um, as well as what I said about the peptic ulcers and it being ubiquitous in our community. Um, and it doesn't affect disease progression, right? So if we think about, if we think about the five pillars of inflammation, what are they? Rubor, red, so that's uh, redness. Um, Kalon, that's heat. Tumor, that's swelling. Um, dolor, that's kind of pain. And the last one is functional, functional lisa or something, right? So that's a like loss of function. And why is that important? Well, because if we don't actually stop the disease from getting worse, then it means that you will eventually lose function. And we see that in rheumatoid arthritis, maybe like within two to three years if uh, therapy isn't actually given. Uh, so in that case, we have to understand that NSAIDs are only for symptomatic relief and they're not actually for disease, um, like prevention of disease or treatment of the disease in itself. Whereas corticosteroids can be done alongside DMAR therapy, um, to actually help the disease. We're not really sure if it does um, like directly impact the disease progression itself, uh, but we just do have to be careful about its side effects, about like, you know, doing, uh, taking it off slowly, as well as kind of uh, the impacts of um, this, like at the end of the day, glucocorticoids are still hormone, and hormones are always in whack with each other. All right, I'll quickly go through DMARDS. DMARDS is relatively, actually, mm, DMARDS is pretty like medium yield. Like you do need to know it um, as Michelle Leach like loves these drugs. So you just know that they'll be on your exams. And honestly, DMARDS are pretty interesting. So the difference between DMARDS from uh, other drugs is that, is that DMARDS, right? Like DMARDS, they actually are not like all the same, right? They don't all work in the same way. They're called disease modifying anti rheumatic So they don't actually all work in the same way, but they all modify the disease progression. So that's like rheumatoid arthritis, methotrexate, for example, is also used in cancer. So they can be all grouped together to all target a single disease, but they don't all work in the same way. So you do have to learn these ones individually rather than, uh, compared to like NSAIDs and things like that. Um, go through your e-pharma and just like, kind of learn it yourself. I have notes coming up in the following slide, so you'll be able to see it. And I'll just go through it a bit brief, like very quickly. So sulfur salazine is kind of more like salicylic acid plus a folate um, antagonist, uh, but we're not exactly sure how it works. Um, so there's a little bit of ambiguity there. Um, but methotrexate is a very classic one about folate acid antagonist, right? And that prevents DNA replication in these really quick dividing cells. 
And what do we know about cancer? Well, cancer is often the sparse divided cells, right? So methotrexate is often used there. But we do know that you can't use methotrexate in uh, a lot of, um, like, for example, in pregnancy, as that will kind of lead to neurotube defects. In Fitzamab, all right, so this is, I've got a good one to kind of um, do it is, if you look at infliximab, right, like that is like the IXI in it looks kind of like a flag that has like an X in it. So it kind of shows like it's like death. What does death mean? Oh, it's necrosis. So it's like tumor necrosis factor. Um, I just like draw on these words and kind of make an image out of it. And that's like eventually how I remember it. So definitely find which way it works for you. Uh, allopurinol blocks xanthine oxidase. Um, xanthine oxidase is what actually produces the urate. So that's your uric acid and things like that. And so this helps the crystal dissolve and stops attacks of gout. So that's allopurinol. It works on the xanthine oxidase. And colchicine. Uh, colchicine essentially is decreases swelling and prevents the buildup of uric acid that actually causes the pain. All right, so some indications. So mainly in rheumatoid arthritis, don't worry too much about the other inflammatory diseases. Right now, just focus on rheumatoid. Osteo um, as well. So osteoarthritis is also pretty important. But as osteoarthritis is usually a result of mechanical damage, um, we do have information there, but it's very different compared to the um, disease caused uh, by rheumatoid arthritis. So the pathophys is very different there. So we can be using this in conjunction with NSAIDs for acute uh, gout attacks. Just remember like these drugs, like they've got different uh, modes of actions um, and they took a little bit of time to kind of get affected, right? Because that makes sense. Because if we're looking at folate and acid and tagus, right, we're blocking up DNA replication for the amount of uh, all the cells that we have. It takes a little bit of time for them to die off, um, produce new ones that are not kind of as inflammatory. And then xanthine oxidase is similar logic there. Um, do not worry about the adverse effects of DMARDs. You probably the only one you should probably know well is methotrexate. They don't really go into allopurinol, infliximab, or colchicine. Like, just know methotrexate as being the, your main one. Like, if you're going to learn one, that's the one you should be learning. All right, so I'm pretty much done, but we don't have enough time to cover like every single detail about every single drug, every single kind of like enzyme that's involved in pathway. And that's not necessary, right? Like once again, going back to what I was saying at the start of the year, you should only be, so, no, sorry, at the start of this talk is you should be focusing on every single piece and about how every single, you should be focusing on how each of the drugs actually work. Like understand the drug flow chart, I guess. And then you will just know like, oh, like at this point this happens. And so this might be a side effect. So then you're not just memorizing side effects, you actually appreciate it. Um, the different impacts of it, um, the, the manipulation of physiology on different parts of the body. I do have my full set of um, pharmacology notes on the Google Drive. I do have summary notes, which are much more brief on uh, the Google Drive as well. Uh, if you don't want to read through all of it, you can just do the summaries. Although the pharmacology full one is also like um, is also pretty like pretty dot point and concise. But yeah, that's that's it for for the my drugs for these week. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. Or yeah, just like if you, anyone have any questions now, happy to answer. Um, and also, we didn't realize. Well, I didn't realize at least how much content there is this week. Um, like, there's a lot. Um, like, it's just looking at it. it kind of scares me. Um, so I don't know if we have time to go through everything, uh, but are there topics that people would like to go through in particular? Um, and then we might skip topics that people don't want to go through. Um, so if you want to drop them in the chat, that would be useful. So for those who don't know what the topics are, there's pain and temperature, which is physiology mainly, sampling and biostatistics, which is pop health, modulation of nerve conduction, which is, I believe, physiology and pharmacology, as well as the peripheral nervous system history and exam. And then lower limb as well. Yeah. Okay, there's a question in the chat. Um, so do steroids, uh, do steroids work by first inhibiting phospholipase A2, which then results in the other effects such as 
inhibition of transcription factors, or does these two work in separate pathways? Um, so thanks, Shreya, for the question. So there is kind of like two parts. Um, so the first one, if uh, I'll just start, I'll find a diagram. Give me one second. All right, so if we look here on this kind of thing, you, you know how like glucocorticoids go to the membrane receptor and it can do this rapid thing? Don't worry about that. Like they don't really talk about that. Like this is the main one you need to do. So glucocorticoids essentially first they go into the, um, okay, so first they go into the gluco, uh, cytoplasmic receptor and that actually causes the um, transcription to decrease. So I think it's more so like transcription actually decreases. And so that leads to uh, a nexin kind of being produced instead. Like that's the um, anti-inflammatory enzymes. So the nexin is anti-inflammatory within the cell itself. And then that leads to pr um, prevention of cyclooxygenase production. And then a nexin actually causes this. So I'll just make sure I an actually answer the question. Um, I think the phospholipase part is like just a result of result of it. I think this is the same one. So it's not like phospholipase first and then transcription factor. I think it will probably be the other way around. Um, so it will probably be like glucocorticoids going to transcription factor leading to the phospholipase being um, not as readily shed off. Um, but I'm not sure to be honest, like regarding the actual phospholipase and, and it being, uh, being done. Um, I'm getting a few requests for, um, yeah, getting a few requests for the notes being, I'll make sure it's on the shared folder instead of like uh, the private one. So you guys any requests. Um, yeah, sorry, did, did that make sense, Shreya? Like I'm not entirely sure whether phospholipase production alone is a result of glucocorticoids. Cool, um, all right. So people want nerve modulation and then a bit of pop health. Oh, pen temp. We probably won't have time to go through all three. You want me to like zoom through pop health? It's quite easy. Yeah. It's like yeah, sure. Okay, we'll I'll like just through go that. through the really important bits. Um yeah, it's okay, I trust you to give a real quick <laughs> <laughs> overview. Um, this week's pop health, um, I think the shoot will be a lot more helpful than the actual lecture because um, I personally don't actually remember a lot of this stuff because you're never actually going to get asked to, I personally don't remember being asked to actually calculate um, a particular statistic. I think we only really ever had to talk about like odds ratio, risk ratio. That was kind of the main things that were really like asked. Um, and especially with your assignment as well. Um, it'll mainly be like you get given a study and they'll actually have these figures and you'll need to analyze what they actually mean. And most of the time they'll already be analyzed in like either the discussion or like the results, they'll actually like go through what everything means. So it's more just like getting an overview of like of what things actually do. Um, basically like what is sampling? Sampling is basically we do it because you can't possibly do like whenever you want to conduct an experiment, you can't possibly survey an entire like population um, unless you do like a census and even then not everyone is going to give you the data you want so basically impossible so we do sampling um, different samples are going to have slightly different results according to different populations especially if you do like randomly selected um, so that means the sample mean is going to differ from your true population mean which is yeah um, so therefore we use confidence intervals so this is the stuff that people will remember from like methods um, or spech, a little bit of PTSD, if it's like not your thing, like statistics is a little bit. Ugh. Um, basically we use this thing called the standard error and it's basically a measure of the average distance 
of the sample mean from the true population mean. If I'm completely honest, I genuinely don't remember learning this. I took this all from like PS Panda slides in my own notes. So like, if I don't remember it, obviously like probably wasn't very important. Um, so yeah, once again, it's just like how to analyze studies that you're going to get given. Um, confidence interval, basically if you, the one that they use the most, 95% confidence interval, we are 95% confident that the true population mean is going to lie within this particular range. Um, there's all these formulas you never, you never get asked to actually calculate a confidence interval. So I personally just wouldn't worry about this, but it's just cool, cool facts to know. Um, data distribution is normal distribution is used a lot in statistics and you'll also remember that from methods or spec, whatever maths you did. Um, basically we use that like 68, 95, whatever the other one is, um, but usually um, it's 95% of results um, are within two, well technically 1.96 standard deviations. Um, and you can have skewed data. So it can either be skewed to the left, which is negatively skewed or skewed to the right, which is positively skewed. Um, once again, never really did any of this. Um, the main thing that does get tested though is hypothesis testing and the errors that come with that. So you've got a null hypothesis, which is um, the hypothesis where there's no significant difference or change. So it usually reads just like a statement. Um, and then you've got the alternative hypothesis, which is where there is a significant difference or change. So the example I used is, um, so the null hypothesis, for example, is the use of statins have no effect on cholesterol levels. Um, whereas your alternative hypothesis would be the use of statins does lower cholesterol levels. So if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative, if the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, there is insufficient evidence to actually reject the null hypothesis. Um, so basically the p-value is just the probability of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis. So of making a type one error, I'm gonna go into the types of errors. Um, and yeah, never really go, like you usually just get asked this thing so the errors that come with it so you can either make a type 1 error which is a false positive or a type 2 error a false negative um this is the meme that they like to use which is, i think personally makes it make a lot of sense um basically out of the, like, the hypothesis testing i would suggest just knowing what a null hypothesis what an alternative hypothesis is and just knowing the two types of errors um yeah, the maths, you, you genuinely don't need to do much maths. Like, I know it seems like freaky, but like you genuinely don't need to know much. Um, this is a bit of an information dump of like the kind of statistical tests. Genuinely, apart from in a tutorial, I have never had to calculate any of these values except for like an odds ratio, potentially for like a quiz or something. Um, but luckily for you guys, there's this fantastic summary table of all the possible tests that can come up in a study that you're looking at, especially for the assignment. And this is what they mean. Um, so this was obviously a very, very quick overview of pop health this week. Um, the tute goes through it in a lot of detail. I think you focus a lot on like the chi squared test as well as like the two, the T tests. Um, you go into a lot of detail. Um, in the actual tute, um, but this mainly like it's used more for like your assignment where you'll notice something that they go like, oh, we calculated like a linear regression. You go, what the hell is a linear regression? And then you just like have to figure out what that actually means. But yeah, really pretty, pretty simple stuff. I think the main important thing would be actually just be like the hypothesis testing because that actually gets asked a lot in exams, the rest, not really. Like you never have to calculate. So don't worry, you don't have to like do lots of maths. There's a question oh, wait, about the diagram, like for positive and negative skew. Oh, okay. Once again, I didn't actually make, technically make these slides. I made them from PSP. Um, let me have a look. No, that's right. Yeah, this is, is right. my writing right or is my diagram wrong? The diagram is correct as well. Yeah, the diagram is correct. So as a further student, I had to do this. 
Um, so whenever you're trying to decide if it's positive or negative skewed, just look at where the tail is. So the small skinny part. And if the small, like the tail is on the positive side, it's positively skewed. And if it's on the negative side, it's negatively skewed. Yeah, that's the easiest way to remember, just where the tail is. Yeah, just further, further Does skills. Does remember if we actually had to do this though? I personally don't think Never so. Seen. There was one, there's basically one possible multiple choice question. And that multiple choice question is, if you have a positively skewed distribution, what will be the, from lowest to highest, what will be the mean, median, and mode? Oh, so if you have a positively so skewed, your mode will be the lowest, there'll be a median, then your mean or vice versa for negative, negatively skewed. That's the only multiple choice question I remember. Yeah. I don't even remember that. So obviously <laughs> I've heard a lot Most of Most of it is like positive predictive, negative yeah, predictive. Yeah, we'll get into like the PPV and the, the negative predictive, whatever the things are called. Um, do we need to know how linear regression and stuff looks? Personally, I don't think you really need to know. You genuinely just need to know like what the definition is and like what the data that like comes out, what it actually means. It's more just like dissecting what the results mean in like the context of the study. So if like you get a result, okay, what does that actually, like what does the odds ratio mean in terms of like this particular statin study or like whatever. Um, you don't actually need to know like how you do it. What does it mean? And like how, like how does it, like how do you actually calculate it? Like no. Nah, right, Heidi, if you just reshare your screen. Um, yes, dear. And go to that table. Now, I like pretty much failed pop health. So that's like why I remember a lot of the exam questions for pop health because I had no idea what they meant when I was sitting it. Anyway, so if you look at this um, table over here, really uh, the only multiple choice questions that you get for this table would be like they, for example, if we look at the row with the two sample t test, okay? So you need to know when you would use these tests. So for what type of data would I do a two sample T test? And that is if I wanna do something where I'm testing two things at the same time. So a possible multiple choice question would be, um, you know, this person would like to, um, this person has the mean height of males uh, and females, um, and they would like to test for the difference between these two variables from different populations. Which of the following tests should this person do? And the multiple choice question might be paired t-test, two sample t-test, uh, a linear regression or a logistic regression. And then you'd say, okay, well, there's two variables they're testing at the same time. Therefore, this person needs to do the two sample t-test. So that's the kind of questions you might get for this particular stuff. <laughs> Every tutor's a bit, but yeah, that's his and Peter's not wrong. <laughs> um, have you guys got your pop health assignment, by the way? Oh, ew. Um, my advice, choose like the one, oh, I don't choose know, like you either choose like the shittiest one so you can talk about how bad it is or you choose the best one where you have all of the data that's like good and just solid and you don't you don't even need to really like worry about it you just go like yep cool 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 check just like fill in all the apparently it's like you guys do it similar to like how we did the ebm assignment so it's like a quiz so you like fill in your answers which is cool and funky but like yeah um but yeah that's all from me do we still have time to do another section? Or are you guys too tired? All good, I'm too tired, or all good, we can continue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. On the grind. Okay, so I think the two contenders were nerve modulation and pain and temperature. Peter, do you think we can get through both of them? Not presenting. Oh uh, wait, what? Uh, I thought you were this doing nerve modulation. No, like nerve modulation isn't that long. I'm not sure about being in temperature. Um, I mean, I could be blast through, but if mo nerve modulation isn't long, do you want to just do that first? Yeah, sure. Thank you.
All right. Um, okay. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, so for nerve modulation, we're going to firstly review um, the basics that you have covered for action and potential. Um, so, yeah, so you need to know there's for an action potential, again, there's an all or nothing depolarization of a neuron. So you have your sodium influx and your potassium influx. And so you have to remember your up phase and your down phase. So your up phase is due to um, rapid sodium influx because there's an increase in sodium permeability because there's your sodium voltage channels which open up and this causes your membrane to depolarize. And your downward phase is the repolarization phase and this is when there is a increase in um, K plus permeability because the K plus voltage channels open. Yeah. So yeah, looking at this diagram, just remembering the upward phase is phase two where your um, sodium channels uh, open up and your sodium ions flow in. Repo repolarization is when your um, potassium channels open up and you have potassium ions that flow out. So with this in mind, we're going to focus on the pharmacology aspect of it. So you you probably might have your lecture already, but um, the main um, drug that involves this whole Action potential is your local anesthetic. So, your local anesthetic binds to the intracellular region of your uh, sodium voltage channel. So, what this does that it prevents sodium influx. So, when you prevent sodium influx, you're basically preventing depolarization. When you prevent depolarization, you prevent a neurotransmission. And so, you have to learn a few examples of it. And usually, um, there's a, like most of the anesthetics end with cane. Yeah, so that's how you know that's a local anesthetic. And the main one you need to know is lignocaine. So um, yeah, so just looking at the molecular structure of it, you'll have a lipophilic group, you have a hydrophilic group. And the main difference that you need to take note of is this intermediate bond where it could, could be an ester and amide linkage. And because this is important because be, this results in um, difficult properties, different properties for the two types. So you've got amide and ester anesthetics. So um, one way of remembering it, like to separate the two, because you know when you have your exams and when you when you see the drug name, you, if you want to quickly differentiate um, between an amide and ester, um, I think there's something that Richard taught us um, is to look out for an early I, so like in amide, there's there's an I in the first part of the whole thing. So like lignocaine, phylocaine, fulvicaine, yeah. So that those are amides, and esters are everything else. It's just, I mean, it's not a the best way of memorizing it, but it's just one way of seeing it. So um, the main differences that you need to know for amides versus esters are that amides are longer lasting. Um, whereas esters are short lasting. Yeah, and amides are metabolized in the liver and esters are metabolized in the tissue. So looking at factors that affect the action of um, anesthetics, um, there's quite a few factors. So firstly, focusing on lipid solubility. So when you have higher lipophilicity, um, there's higher potent potency. So um, you can Dissolve, dissolve and absorb faster. And secondly, um, your small unmyelinated fibers are more susceptible. So uh, looking at your order, order of blockage, usually your C fibers are the ones which are blocked first. So uh, you'd, you would have learned by now C fibers 
um, transit pin and followed by A delta and then A theta. So that's cold, cold warmth followed by touch pressure. And so this is the order of blockage. So your, your return of sensation would be the opposite. So your touch returns first, followed by temperature, followed by pain, as, as your anesthetic wears off. So there's a few other factors that you need to take note of. Um, ionization status and pH. So um, this is something you might have touched on before. So local anesthetics are weak bases. So um, you, you have to remember that weak acids are easily absorbed in acidic conditions because they are more unionized, and weak bases are easily absorbed in basic conditions because they're more ion, un, more un, uh, more unionized, right? So looking at local anesthetics, they're weak bases, so they're easily absorbed in basic conditions. Yeah. So um, looking at Looking at this, so if you have an inflamed tissue, usually you'd be more acidic, so it's further nice, so it's less effective. And um, a high pH would mean that it's largely ionized. It can be more effective because it's more lipophilic and it can cross the membrane easily. Yeah. So again, just looking at the acidity, so um, weak basis in high pH environments, so your equilibrium is shift to the right. You have more unionized B, and if, if you have weak acids in the low pH, um, equilibrium shifts to your left, so you have more unionized AH. So um, they are absorbed um, easily in a low pH environment. So another thing that you need to take note of is use dependence. So um, local anesthetics can only block um, voltage gated sodium channels only when they are open or inactive. So you remember that voltage gated channels have three phases. They are closed, open or inactive. So it can only block them when they are open or inactive. And um, your high fire, firing rates shift the majority of these channels to being open or inactive form. Um, and so when you have increased frequency of firing, so it, this results in increased susceptibility to an anesthetic. So it basically, it just means that your blockage is proportional to the frequency of firing. If these channels aren't firing as much and if they're closed, they won't be um, as susceptible to an anesthetic. So yeah, just looking at different methods of application, you know that like any drug, you can administer it in different methods. So yeah, just topical infiltration and whatever not, yeah. And yeah, so focusing on this, there's a few factors that affect the absorption of an anesthetic. So like in, as any drug, uh, the dosage, the site of injection, and your drug tissue binding affects the absorption of anesthetics. But more importantly, um, one factor such as, which is blood flow, really affects the absorption of anesthetics, local anesthetics in particular. So um, if you have an inflamed tissue, you'll have vessels that carry blood flow around the site, right? And this affects your removal rate of your anesthetic. So if you have a vasodil if there's vasodilation, that is basically increased flow because your arteries are wider, more blood can flow through, there's decreased resistance. And this means that um, your anesthetic is system system systematically distributed. And this basically reduces the amount of anesthetic in that particular local um, area and increases systemic effect. And vice versa, when there's less constriction, it prolongs the anesthetic effect locally and reduces systemic toxicity. Yeah, so um, going on from that, there's a few systemic effects that can result from local anesthetics if it's not, the precautions aren't adhered to. So we have CNS effects, um, so, like, you would have dose-dependent restlessness and all of these shivering, metallic taste, convulsions. You don't really need to know the, the specific effects, but just to point out to you that there can be adverse effects if you allow, if you don't take into consideration the systemic, um, the blood flow 
which could result in systemic effects, and as well as uh, cardiovascular effects, yeah, which could lead to conduction block. Yeah. So yeah, moving on from that, we're going to learn specifically a few drug types that you need to know the mechanism of action as well as the adverse effects. So um, lidocaine or um, lignocaine, again, you need to know it's a amide because there's the early I in the, in the word. So it binds the intracellular part of your um, sodium voltage channel, prevents depolarization. And you got to remember it's reversible. And since it's an amide, it has a long half-life. And yeah, an adverse effect is that it's an allergic reaction. Then bubivacaine, um, again, same, same MOA. And since it's an amide, has a long half-life. Half and there's a few, there's an extra adverse effect of it being cardiotoxic. Um, tetracaine, um, notice there's no I here, so it's in ester. So a few side effects is skin redness, cornea damage, and allergic reaction. Yeah, that's it. That's the main drugs you need to take note of. And similarly, you just have to know for, you just have to differentiate between amide and ester, and from there, the side effects are almost similar. Yeah. All good? Yeah, yeah. Um, Fishing Han, do you think uh, your pen stuff will take? Um, I mean, I, I can probably rush. Yeah, I can probably rush um, if, if anyone still wants me to go through it. It's not too hard, I don't think. Um, okay. I don't mind, okay. I'll, I'll just, okay, well, we might as well do it. We might as well just, just do it. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're tired, you, you can leave. It's being recorded anyways. Yep. Okay. So um, this lecture, I believe, at least for us, it was given to us by Richard. And I personally believe it was actually a really good lecture. I'm not too sure if Richard's still going to give it to you guys this year, given that he's probably loaded with a lot of other work given COVID-19. Um, but anyways, uh, let's get into it. So first of all, what is the function of pain? Uh, so obviously no one really likes pain uh, because it's an unpleasant sensory as well as an emotional experience, uh, usually associated with actual or uh, potential tissue damage. Um, however, we need to understand that it's not 100% a bad thing because pain is technically a protective uh, mechanism. Because whenever we're in pain, um, our natural response is to want to stop doing whatever it was that was hurting us. Uh, so that's why it's good in that way in um, how pain can actually protect us from harm. Uh, it's also a type of non-discriminative uh, somatic sensation, which I believe uh, was revision from semester one. Uh, so here are a few um, terminology. So I'm going to butcher it. Uh, dysesthesia uh, is just an abnormal, unpleasant sensation. Allodynia is when you are um, experiencing pain from otherwise um, normally non-painful stimuli. So an easy example would be, uh, think of your skin. Um, if you got a really bad sunburn and you run your fingers across your sunburnt skin, uh, you might feel a bit of pain. Whereas normally, if your skin wasn't sunburnt and you ran your fingers across your skin, uh, you probably wouldn't feel pain. Hyperalgesia um, is response to a noxious stimuli um, when it's exaggerated. And so just a quick reminder on what non-discriminative somatic sensations are. One of them uh, is pain. The other is thermal sensations, so sensing between warm and cold, as well as crude touch. Okay, so now moving on to the nerves or the nerve fibers that are actually responsible for uh, transmitting pain sensations. Uh, we call them nociceptors. So here are a few characteristics of nociceptors that we should know. Uh, so first of all, nociceptive fibers are free nerve endings. So if we look at this diagram here, um, it's a free nerve ending, unlike some other uh, nerves uh, which are encapsulated, this is unencapsulated. Um, nociceptors are also one of the most abundant of all somatic receptors. Uh, 
Uh, nociceptors are what we call polymodal, so they can respond to a variety of uh, stimuli as long uh, damaging levels, so um, at a strong enough, I guess, stimuli to actually cause us uh, potential tissue damage and pain. Uh, so this could be things like a mechanical stimuli where you get punched in the face, or it could be a chemical stimuli where you get a chemical burn. Okay, so nociceptors can respond to a variety of things. And the cell body of our nociceptors are located in the sensory ganglion. Okay, so just a few more characteristics. Uh, one important thing to remember is that nociceptors pretty much, uh, there might be exceptions, but overall they adapt very little or not at all. And by adapt, we mean that they stop firing when they get constantly stimulated. So if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. Uh, so for example, um, if someone is punching you in the face and you feel pain in your face, you're not just gonna suddenly stop feeling pain um, even though the person continues to bash you, okay? So if you constantly get hit in the face, you'll constantly feel the pain because your nociceptors aren't gonna stop firing uh, just because they're getting stimulated a lot. And a lot of the times excitation of our nociceptors actually becomes progressively greater um, as this pain stimulus continues. And this is especially the case for slow pain. Um, and we'll talk about slow pain uh, in the future slides. So moving on to the concept of sensitization versus activation of nociceptors, which David previously touched on with his honey and bee analogy. So I'll quickly go over this again. So sensitization of our nociceptors, all it means is that we're lowering the threshold and they fire a lot easier, okay? And so in this table here, you really just have to know the three rows in red, okay? Um, and that is things like prostaglandins and leukotrienes, therefore sensitization. Okay, so they don't actually cause the pain, but they just lower the threshold, okay, and makes our nociceptors fire easier. Versus something like histamine, uh, which actually activates our nociceptors and produces pain. Uh, so once again, if David's honey analogy wasn't enough, uh, here's the table for it. And just a quick side note that mild stimulation of our nociceptors, uh, so when the stimuli isn't at a damaging level, uh, this can produce you know, an itch or a ticklish sensation. And so really when you're feeling ticklish, it's actually your body sensing that there could be uh, potential damage about to happen. So for example, if someone goes from tickling you to punching you, okay? All right, moving on to something called TRP receptor channels. So we just touched on the nerve fibers, okay? They're called nociceptors, but what are the um, receptors on the ends of our nociceptors? Okay, they're called TRP receptor channels. And TRP stands for transient receptor potential uh, channels. And they have been identified to respond to a number of strong stimuli, uh, which causes our pain. Uh, so TRPV1 receptors, they are gated ion channels on the ends of our nociceptive nerves. And activation uh, of these receptors opens the channel uh, to allow an influx of sodium or calcium to depolarize the nerve and thus initiating our action uh, potential. Okay, so when our nociceptors are uh, fire off, um, they activate our TRPV1 gated ion channels, they open up and depolarization happens and action potential occurs. Uh, this is just a quick side note. So capsaicin, uh, which is the thing that's found in chili, which uh, is what uh, causes chili to be spicy, uh, is actually known to be one of the most potent substances capable of um, opening or stimulating our uh, TRPV1 receptors. So really when you're eating spicy food, all you're doing um, is you are technically activating your pain receptors. And because it's so potent, it can be used to slightly desensitize our TRPV1 receptors. That's just a fun fact. Okay, so moving on to different fiber types, I believe this is a little bit of revision from semester one. So uh, we have different nerve fiber types. Uh, so we have our two large ones, our large myelinated A alpha, our large myelinated A beta. And these are responsible for discriminative sensation. And so both of our large ones are um, heavy in terms of their myelination. This is contrasted with our two small uh, fiber types. So we have our small lightly myelinated A delta fibers, uh, which is in charge of pain and temperature or non-discriminative sensation. Uh, typically, uh, A delta is responsible for a um, mechanical stimuli. 
And then we have our small unmyelinated C fibers so that it has no myelination at all. It's also in charge of our non-discriminative sensations such as pain and temperature. But unlike our A delta, which is mainly, I would say, um, mechanical stimuli, our C fibers are polymodal. Okay, so they do, you know, extreme temperature such as a burn. Um, they do mechanical, so punching you in the face, as well as a, a chemical burn. Okay, so just remember that. Okay, so this is just a quick revision of of you know the pathway of how your um, signals go through your afferent or your nociceptive afferent fibers, and so quick revision they obviously um, come in from the peripheral stimuli. The signal travels through your afferent neurons. The cell bodies are located in our dorsal root ganglion, our DRG, and then they uh, synapse at the dorsal horn, and then they decussate. Okay. And we'll come back to uh, this, decus this immediate decussation um, when we're talking about our ascending pathways. So um, this, once again, is kind of revision from last semester. So we'll quickly go over it. So here I've put a table of uh, common ascending pathways. But the one that we're going to focus on today is mainly our uh, lateral spinothalamic tract. Um, and so just remember that our spinothalamic tracts versus our DCML, it's slower. Okay, and now you, it's easy to remember why it's slower because the fibers are one, small, and two, our C fibers are unmyelinated. Okay, so they can't transmit the signals as quickly. Uh, just like the previous diagram, as soon as it synapses in the dorsal horn, our spinothalamic pathway immediately decussates to the other side, unlike our DCML, which decussates a bit later. Um, Sensations passing through the spinothalamic tract typically have a poor spatial localization. So you kind of can't really pinpoint exactly where uh, the pain is coming from a lot of the times. And our spinothalamic tract, they transmit pain, temperature, as well as a ticklish or an itching um, light touch sensation. So because we're talking about pain today, okay, pain and temperature, uh, these guys are transmitted via our lateral spinothalamic tract. So we're going to focus on that one today. So now we're moving on to the phases of nociception. And by phases, I mean, how do we go from a peripheral noxious stimuli to actually our brain or our mind perceiving the uh, sensation of pain? Okay, so there's four main phases, transduction, transmission, modulation, and perception. This table here is a summary. We're not gonna go over it because we're gonna go over each one in a bit of detail. So the first one is transduction. This is really easy to understand because it's the first one, okay? Uh, the first phase, we obviously have to first have a noxious stimuli, okay? And so this could be mechanical, um, it could be extreme temperatures, or it could be chemical. Okay, so that's transduction. Moving on to the next phase, uh, phase two, which is transmission. So transmission refers to the pathway involved in actually sending the information from our noxious stimuli up to our brain. And if you remember from semester one, uh, in our ascending pathways, we're going to have our uh, first, second and third order neurons. So let's quickly run over these again. Our first order, okay, this is our primary afferent. Okay, this actually carries the information um, from the uh, site of injury or the noxious stimuli, okay, into our spinal cord and it is going to synapse at the dorsal horn, uh, if you can see where my mouse is. Okay, it's going to synapse onto our second order neuron, okay, and since uh, it synapses in the dorsal horn, the cell body of our second order neuron is obviously going to be in the uh, spinal cord and it's going to decussate immediately and relay this information up onto the higher centres, okay, uh, of our brain where it's finally going to synapse onto our third order neuron at the level of the thalamus. Okay, so our third order uh, neurons, their cell body is at the thalamus because that's where the previous uh, synapse happened. Okay, and then the, our third order neuron is going to then finally relay this information to our somatosensory cortex. So a bit of revision there. Okay, so I think this is probably the new, the newer part, okay, uh, of the phases of nociception, and that is modulation. Uh, and so that is our final perception of pain. In other words, how painful uh, do we actually feel? Okay, this degree of painfulness can actually be modulated or altered via um, descending pathways. Okay, so descending pathways, they can form an anti-nociceptive pathway. So they can decrease 
okay, the pain that we feel. So inputs for this, you know, anti uh, nociceptive pathway uh, come from the cortex and the thalamus and all this information essentially just remember it converges at this place called the paraaqueductal gray or the PAG, which is in our midbrain. Okay, and then from here, uh, the it's going to the information is going to travel down a descending pathway. So down our spinal cord and it's going to synapse onto an inhibitory interneuron okay at the level of our spinal cord and it's this inhibitory interneuron that is then going to release something called encephalins and it's this stuff called encephalins that ultimately helps to inhibit our pain signals so let's actually have a look at that last long sentence i just said in a bit more detail so from our uh, PAG coming down the descending pathway and it's going to synapse onto, as we said before, an inhibitory interneuron here in red. Okay, this is happening in the dorsal horn at the level of the spinal cord. Now, this inhibitory interneuron is then going to release something uh, called encephalins. Okay, so what are encephalins? They're essentially endogenous opioids. Okay, so these are opioids made by, made by our own body that helps to decrease the amount of pain we feel. Okay, um, so they are kind of like transmitters. Okay, they're stored in the interneurons um, and they will act on opioid receptors uh, and inhibit the firing of our nociceptive uh, afferent neuron. All right, so if we look at this diagram here, okay, C, uh, which is our primary afferent neuron, okay, as shown here, it's trying to come down here and it wants to, okay, synapse onto our second order neuron here, but it can't, okay, because our encephalins are essentially blocking it via opioid receptors. Uh, so that's how modulation works, or that's how the descending pathways work. Okay, finally, going on to a uh, phase four of um, no susception, and this is perception. And once again, this is really easy to understand uh, because this is the last phase of no susception. In other words, that's when we actually become conscious um, of the pain. Okay, and that's when the pain signals uh, finally reaches our cortex. And what you need to understand is our perception of pain. Okay, is going to uh, depend on you know how things are working in our previous uh, three phases. Okay, so if there's uh, no noxious stimuli, probably not going to get pain. Okay, if something happens via the uh, transmission phase, the information can't get sent to our cortex, then once again, we're not going to perceive the pain, even though there might be injury. As well as modulation, so if we have these descending pathways coming down, releasing these encephalins, uh, the amount of pain we end up perceiving, okay, might be a lot less. Okay, quickly moving on to types of pain. So as I said before, there's fast pain and there's slow pain. So fast pain is transmitted via our A-delta fibers. Okay, and this is uh, typically uh, due to intense mechanical stimuli. Okay, so like someone, I don't know, punching you in the face or you're hitting yourself with a hammer. And a lot of the times the pain will be described as a sharp pain or a pricking pain. Uh, it's localized, there's, it's typically got a shorter duration, okay, and therefore there's less emotional overtones because the pain just disappears after a while. Compare that to our slow pain, which is mainly transmitted by our C-type fibres. Um, because it's C-type fibres, slow pain is, uh, can be due to a variety of uh, stimuli. So yes, it still could be due to mechanical stimuli. It could also be due to chemicals, heat, and cold, as well as other types of tissue damage, is typically described as a dull or a burning uh, type of pain. And it's more poorly localized, has a longer duration, and therefore is more difficult to endure. Now, this bottom row down here was in the lecture, but really I personally think it's not too high yield. Uh, so fast pain, um, where um, does the you know the afferent uh, neuron terminate? It terminates in lamina one, so this pink region here. Um, whereas our slow pain uh, terminates in laminas two and three of the dorsal horn, which is also known as the substantia gelatinosa. Uh, but really, I think pretty low yield. And for fast pain, where I've said precision nociceptive withdrawal reflex, I'm pretty sure that just means, for example, you accidentally touch the end of a, a needle and you accidentally prick yourself, um, 
you're gonna naturally um, draw your hand back um, and that's kind of like a reflex uh, that your body does to stop yourself from uh, doing more harm by keeping your finger on the sharp needle. So before we said that pain and temperature is transmitted via the lateral spinothalamic tract, okay? But you can actually further break down the lateral spinothalamic tract into the neo and the paleo spinothalamic tract. So fast pain is transmitted via the neospinothalamic uh, neo tract. And what's important to remember here is the afferent fibers that enter, okay? They pretty much all of them, okay, end up uh, transmitting the signal to your somatosensory cortex. Now, verse, compare that to our slow pain, which is um, going up the paleospinothalamic tract. Uh, only one-tenth of the fibres actually end up, okay, all the way into the thalamus and our higher centres. The other nine-tenths just kind of just fizzle out almost in the lower regions of our brain, okay? And so that's one of the main reasons why slow pain uh, is more poorly localized because only one tenth of the pain fibers are actually um, going all the way up to our higher centers. Uh, we can also classify pain in terms of somatic or visceral. Um, I'm pretty sure that is revision from last semester, so I'll quickly skip over that. We also have something called the gate theory of pain. Uh, you will learn more about this in uh, psych, but for physiology, all you need to know is um, non-painful stimuli can what we call close the gate uh, to our ability to sense pain. And the a really good example of this is, for example, you've just hit your toe on the door and you bend down and you kind of rub your toe after you hit it. And for some reason, that kind of seems to reduce the sensation of pain. Okay, so the non-painful stimuli here is rubbing your toe. Okay, and, be, and this is kind of closing the gate based on this theory. And so therefore uh, you're reducing the sensation of pain. You'll learn more about this in psych. Okay, referred pain, what is referred pain? Just like its name, it's when pain in one part of the body is felt in another part of the body. And there are essentially two um, theories uh, for why referred pain actually occurs. Uh, the first one is called the common dermatome hypothesis. And that just means that pain is going to be referred to a structure that's kind of developed from the same embryonic segment. Okay. And a common one could be, for example, the heart uh, can refer pain to the left arm, jaw or neck. Okay. Because of its um, embryo, embryological uh, development. Because hashtag embryology matters. Okay. The other theory is uh, the convergence hypothesis. And so this theory says Okay, that branches essentially uh, coming from our viscera, so for example, our heart, as well as coming from our skin, okay, both of them synapse onto the same second order uh, neuron, okay, uh, that then goes up to our brain. And so therefore, uh, because it synapses onto the same second order neuron, uh, that's why our brain is a bit confused. It's like, well, I've gotten this signal from this second order neuron. I don't really know which, you know, afferent, um, primary afferent neuron it came from. So guess what? I'm just going to send the pain down to both of them. Huh. Okay. All right. Moving on to uh, the temperature part of this, um, these slides. So nociceptors for pain, we've also got something called thermoreceptors for uh, sensing temperature. And just like our nociceptors, our thermoreceptors are also free nerve endings in the skin. And we are up to 10 times more cold sensitive um, than heat sensitive. So there's literally one slide here in, on thermoreceptors. And I think this is probably the only high yield stuff you need to remember. Um, so that is the fire in patterns. So our warm and our cold receptors, okay, uh, have slightly different firing patterns. There's two types of firing patterns, one um, tonic and the other one called phasic. So let's focus on tonic first because that appears in both of our warm and our cold receptors. By tonic firing, that just means um, a steady firing rate. Okay, so the impulses um, are essentially occurring at a steady rate. So if we look at this uh, top graph over here and we look at our warm receptors which is the line in orange okay um, our warm receptors are going to start firing steadily at around 30 degrees because that's kind of when things start to get kind of warm okay and they're going to increase their rate of firing until around 44 to 46 degrees which is which is pretty hot 
And then you see that it suddenly drops and stops uh, firing. And that is because we essentially reached a high enough temperature where we're feeling pain uh, and not just, wow, today's hot, it's wow, I'm burning, all right? If we look at the tonic firing for our cold receptors, which is here in blue, uh, we see that it's kind of pr it's pretty quiet at our higher temperatures of around 40, okay, because, you know, they're cold receptors. They wouldn't really fire when it's, you know, warm temperature. Now, the firing mainly increases at around a temperature of 24 to 28 degrees here and then slowly starts to dip down again and then firing will cease when temperatures drop below 10 degrees. Um, because technically, if you think about it, if you're outside with no clothes on at 10 degrees, um, that's pretty much when you're going to start feeling the more negative effects of extreme cold, such as our hypothermia. Okay, moving on to the what's called phasic firing. Okay, so phasic firing essentially just means that there's a shift, okay, in the uh, firing rate. And only our cold receptors have phasic firing. So when there is a sudden shift, okay, from 20.5 degrees to 15.2 degrees, okay, we see that the firing rate of our cold receptors suddenly increase, okay, when there's this huge drop. However, the new steady state or the new um, firing rate for its tonic phase is actually at a lower level compared to its original uh, firing rate. Uh, we can contrast this, okay, with a different temperature shift. So if we suddenly shift from 35 degrees down to 31.5 degrees, yes, we're still going to, you know, transiently increase our firing rate. However, the difference lies in what the new steady state is. Okay, so going from 35 to 31.5, our new steady state is actually going to be higher compared to our original firing rate. Okay, and I think that is that is all. Thanks, Ching. Um, somehow we get we did cover everything, which is a bit scary. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any last questions? Um, otherwise, otherwise, um, otherwise we'll finish up there. Yeah, good job guys, like two hours. <laughs> yeah, that was very tiring. <laughs> and I didn't even present. Um, cool, but we'll upload this afterwards. Um, and then just like text us if you have any questions. Okay. See you guys. Have a good week. Hope everything's all right. Stay yeah, safe. Bye -bye.